Hello, everyone, and welcome to the press conference for Yagden, the hunt. And I will introduce the people. Quite a few people are with us today. Two of them are actually not uh, st sitting with us at the table, but they're somewhere in the audience. The two producers, uh, Mr. Morton Kaufman and, Sis and Miss Sissy Graum Jurgensen. I don't know where you are. Please stand up. There they are. Uh, in 1998, Feston, his first feature, I think, made quite a splash in Cannes. He's back this year. It took him a while to come back. Director Thomas Winterberg. <laughs> At my far left, your far right, nothing political, um, the scriptwriter, now also a director, but here today only in his capacity as a scriptwriter, Mr. Tobias Lindholm. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to him as Agnes, uh, Miss Anne Louise Hassing. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to her as Nadia, Miss Alexandra Rappaport. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to me as Brun, Mr. Lars Runter. <laughs> what? No. Okay. It's all right. It's all right. Sitting to the left of uh, Mr. Winterberg, uh, an actor who was in Pusher, an actor who, more to the point, uh, made uh, was in uh, Mr. Winterberg's Oscar-winning short uh, last round in 1993 as Theo, Mr. Thomas Bo Larson. Now, about the lady sitting next to Mr. Rante, I asked around, and I was told that, to put it simply, she was the Scandinavian equivalent of Dame Joan Plowright, Dame Maggie Smith, and Dame Judi Dench rolled into one. So, as Greta, Mrs. Savold. And finally, as Lucas, uh, a character which represents a 180 degrees turn from the pusher, and I'm not even bringing up James Bond, Mr. Mads Mickelson. <laughs> and the first question is here. Hello? Yeah. Um, I'm uh, Terje Itzvog from uh, Adresseavisen Norway. I have a question for two questions for Mr. Winterberg. The first one is, uh, uh, the, the story in this film looks very parallel to a Norwegian scandal in the early 90s, the so-called Bjung case. Uh, can you say something about uh, if it's inspired and its parallels? And the second question is, this is uh, a strong story about an innocent man. What's your thought on the movie's potential for making it harder for children actually to be believed when talking about abuse? Um, to answer the first question, uh, this film is inspired by quite a few cases, one of which is the Bjorn case for, from Norway. Uh, we read several cases, did a lot of research, and frighteningly enough, there are a lot of these cases. Um, we, of course, quite early in the process, had to step out of real life and into drama. So this is fully fiction and our own sick fantasy, you can say. Um, I find it very important to say that, again, in a case like this, the kids are the victims. Um, they are the one drawing the short straw. In this case, we claim that a, a child lies. She lies to satisfy the grown-ups. What happens then is, a, is that a huge fantasy appears in front of her. Her mother starts crying. People are put in prison. They're sent to gynecologists. And this huge illusion that, so, that something bad happened to them appears in front of them and becomes part of their memory. And they will suffer from this the rest of their lives, such as the ones who actually really suffered from this. I felt it important to address these matters, yes. And for the second part. Oh. Okay. Second who has the mic? The okay, go ahead. Oh, um, you were, there was a second question, right? Yes. yes. Uh, well, um, there is a convention saying that 
children. In Denmark, we have a saying that children and drunk people always tell the truth. Um, yes, we are claiming that this is not always the truth. We are saying that people sometimes lie, also kids. Uh, but what we're also saying is they're lying to satisfy the grown-ups around them. Was that enough answer? Great, thank you. Ma'am, and then the gentleman here, and then the lady here. This is a question for Thomas Winterberg. Um, Deborah Cole from, from AFP News Agency. It's a follow-up question to that one, because I was wondering, you know, you've taken a very controversial take on, on this delicate subject matter, and I was wondering if you had encountered any resistance already with the script, and whether you expect any sort of blowback by your controversial take on, on the subject of child molestation. <coughs> well, I've... I'm not taking anything for granted, and I don't know what's going to come out of this, but in all due respect, what we try to do is a film about the loss of innocence. Here's a bunch of naked men uh, fooling around. Like in my childhood, I grew up in a hippie commune uh, surrounded by genitals, and it was all very pure and all very innocent, okay? And things have changed. Things have become colder, and more fearful, obviously. We've lost the innocence, and for good reasons, of course, because there are good reasons for that. I, I was here to tell that in 98. Um, now I'm here to tell the antithesis, and I'm afraid the sad truth is somewhere in between these movies. Sir. Um, good afternoon, uh, Bruce Kirkland. From, uh, Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun. I'd like to turn this to Mads, Mads Mikkelsen, because for example, we, we love seeing you as a Bond villain, as uh, Henri had mentioned. We love uh, seeing you as a, uh, a brute uh, of a Viking in Valhalla Rising. But we also are thrilled when you do a contemporary story and you're embodying some of the ideas that Thomas has talked about already in a very uh, you know human drama like this. And this is when you're at your best from our point of view. And I'm curious, from your point of view, what thrill there is to embrace a story like this and what you want to tell about the, uh, the saga that Thomas was uh, referring to? Well, there's many ways to approach a story. I think that um, <clears throat> one is the story itself. Another thing is uh, to be working with Thomas. A different way, thing is to be working with old friends I've never worked with. Uh, and, uh, and the third thing is the character itself. Uh, we were uh, pretty firm from the very beginning that we were not going to make this into a thriller. Did he do it or did he not do it? We are talking about an innocent man from the very beginning. Uh, and for us, it was not so much a film about cases like this. We know for sure that way too many kids are being abused out there. We know that. We're not questioning that. And we also know that some cases are like we're portraying in this film. But for us, it was uh, very much about when you love something as much as you can love a child, that will, love will be turning to fear when something happens or might happen. And how a little society of old friends and relatives and, and colleagues can implode with this fear. Love is extremely powerful and will be as powerful when it's turned around. And that's what the story where we actually wanted to, to, to uh, give life to, not so much the political drama of cases like this, but uh, that's kind of like a little benefit as well. If I may jump in, according to the production notes, Mr. Winterberg, this, this story, this film, came out of a batch of papers that you got some, sometime 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that you didn't read uh, until fairly recently before you started the film. At which point did uh, Mr. Lindholm come in, and why, what did you bring to the part, sir? When, 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 when Thomas and I finished Submarino, we, um, we agreed to, do, to work together again. Um, you had already worked together, yeah, we had worked on, together Submarino. on Submarino. And, and, and we, we, we found it quite fun to write together. Um, we, are, we are writing in the same way, you can say. We love the natural stories we like, we like to tell uh, in reality. So the love for reality uh, was, 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 um, was there. And then Thomas came and told about this story that he had. I had become a father doing Submarino, so the paranoia of being a parent um, was in me. And I was very, um, 
uh, intrigued when, when, when Thomas came to ask me about this story. So that's when I jumped in and then we just started to talk about the subject. And what was most important for us from the beginning was to say this is a man who didn't do it. So you can say, of course, we read a lot of cases about the subject, but most of all, we looked at it as a witch hunt, which has happened in history for a long time. In different cases in the 50s in the US, it was communists. Um, after the Second World War in Denmark, it was Nazis. But, but, but still, the idea to hunt down a person and to, to put that into to some kind of, um, of well-structured story was our main goal. So that's what we went down to do. Thank you. Ma'am, and then over there. My name is Nandini, I'm from India. My first question is to Mr. Winterberg. Um, this is a very powerful film, but it also hinges on powerful performances from the actors. I'm specifically interested in how you worked with the child actor who plays Clara. How much of the plot did you tell her? And how did you elicit reactions from her? Um, and my second question is to Mr. Uh, and, uh, one step at a time, thank you. Go ahead, Thomas. Well, Annika, as she's called, is a natural talent. She's, um, she's just incredible. They all felt very fearful when she was around because she, <laughs> she, she's just really incredibly good. It's not because I'm a genius. Yes, I am a genius, but, but, <laughs> but in this case, she did it her own. Um, and she had a very good trainee called Yede. She was absolutely splendid. Uh, and she understood what I was talking about, but of course we did not let her into the, the dirty world of this story. She understood that this guy did something wrong or did not do something wrong, but she did something wrong about it. She understood the plot without being sort of uh, led into to the world of, of sexualities. Um, she's brilliant, and the dog was brilliant too, and, were, and, and was uh, a lot of pressure on these people. Second part. Is uh, when you meet Clara again, and my favorite scene in the film was when she's looking at those lines and you say, How are we going to cross all of these? Mm -hmm. And when you lift her, there's a little moment of hesitation, a little bit of awkwardness. But um, the character doesn't feel that awkwardness with anybody else after the time passes. You know, like we suddenly jump to when his son gets uh, the hunting license. So how did you reconcile those reactions in your head as the character? H how do you think the character would have reacted to all those people aside from Clara? At, 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 the, at the moment when the years passed? Uh, yeah, when yeah. the years passed. And I mean, did you feel it was entirely authentic that he's you know, completely normal with everybody else except Clara? Um, yeah, I did in the sense that we created a very stubborn person. And at the same time, we created a person who had very big difficulties saying no and put down his foot, uh, which is a uh, combination from hell when he's in a situation like this. Uh, no, he insists on staying there. He insists on shopping in his shopping mall. He insists on going to his church. So he insists that his friends are still his friends. Uh, it's not easy for him, but if you have to go that way down that path, you have to do it fully, 100%. Somebody's talking. Sorry, walking <laughs> out. This is Thomas. Uh, no, but I'm, and as you said, I mean, the, <clears throat> the story with her in the end was actually very beautiful because that was, uh, he, he came up with that. We've been discussing that for a long time, how we should, how we should finish the story with the little girl. And then we had many options. And, uh, and then it was such a simple thing that all of a sudden, uh, Thomas saw this little floor full of lines and said, this is the scene. Uh, so that came up in the very last uh, second. Uh, but what was the question? Am I answering the right one? <laughs> Ma'am, go ahead. And then the gentleman next to you. Uh, Karen Batt for the Huffington Post. A question to Mr. Vinterberg. Um, inspired also from what you were saying as well. For me, uh, the film, uh, 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 the child abuse issue was not the main issue. For me, what was interesting was how quickly people can betray each other. And I have a two-part question. One is, what personally interests you about the issue of betrayal and the psychology. I thought the psychology of betrayal was very subtle. And second of all, what I particularly liked was the decision to not make it black and white, that there's an actual movement in the film that goes back to the friend, embracing the friend. And, and whether you had that original idea to not have it just be everyone turns against him, but there's actually a nice little almost, hap almost happy ending. Uh, happy ending. <laughs> wow, we're, we're not used to that <laughs> in Denmark. <laughs> it's a dark and sinister country. 
Listen, um, I don't know if I can answer your question. What I can say is that I find that nobody betrays anyone in this film. I think I can defend each one of these characters and their movements. She's a woman trying to protect a child. And Tobias and I, we worked all the way through the script uh, to defend these characters, to understand how they move and why they emotionally choose the wrong pattern or the wrong path, you say. Uh, the mother, the child, reacts desperate but understandable. They don't betray him. They, they, they just try to defend an innocent child. And uh, that's what's, you know, that's what's so difficult about these cases. We don't know what's true, what's not true. And uh, this is the danger of these cases. And that's what we found very alarming when we read this material, material a, a long way ago. Did I answer? My answer was a no. They did not betray anyone. <laughs> yes. The gentleman next to you, sir. Thank you very much, Jan Lumholt from Svenska Dagbladet in Sweden. I'm going to try to formulate a question about the women in the film. I find them rather intimidating. The, um, the, the head of the kindergarten and the mother are, of course, like uh, from, from uh, instinct, very, very protective. Um, little Clara is like the youngest version we've ever seen of the hell has no fury like a woman scorned character. Uh, we have um, uh, Kirsten, who is only heard on the telephone, who has an effect on, like, Frau Blücher in Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein, where the horse is <laughs> screamed. Uh, you should write a script. And, and <laughs> the, only, the only kind woman in the film is really Alexandra's uh, Nadia character. And interestingly, also, when in the epilogue, when things have kind of settled down, you don't see any of these female characters turning up, except for Nadia. So I don't know if they are supposed to be, have they kind of, uh, are they still kind of taking their distance? Anyway, I'm blabbering around here, but I found this kind of a scary women in, in this film, although by, for very good reason. So did you write uh, from research or like, explain this red thread? You're, you're from Sweden, right? <laughs> Half yeah, well, I, first of all, I want to say that let's save the gender role debate to Scandinavia, right? We're, we're in France, and I'm aware that, that there are only men in main competition this year, and I'm aware that there are some quite scary women in this film, but this is not an articulate attempt to make any attack on any women uh, from, from us. This is an attempt to, to sink into reality, uh, mostly women populate daycare institutions in, in Denmark. And uh, we had a friendship. I have always wanted to make a friendship between these two particular actors, and they happen to be men. That's why. Uh, so I cannot come with a mm, long, deep answer or motivation of how things ended up like that. By the way, I love these women. I love Rappaport in the film, but also the other women. I understand them, and I love them, and adore them. But where are they? Um, she's not a hunter. With her, there's a big question. I couldn't find, we couldn't really find out whether this marriage just broke up or whether they stayed together. And any answer to it felt banal. Each one of the answers, which is why we wanted to leave it open. Um, there's a lot of things open at the end and it's, it's kind of a diabolic end and uh, we fancy that. We like that. Well, then, let's hear it from the ladies. The, what, do you agree with this gentleman's approach to the characters you portray? And if you want to jump in and contradict your director, this is your chance. <laughs> yes, go ahead. I understand what you're saying, that um, the kind of mean women. <laughs> See, no, not mean, but, but yeah, yeah, like um, going over the, the limits. But uh, my character, I... I, I I think that she's, as Thomas said, she's doing what she thinks is the very right thing to do to protect her child. And um, so she, she's just, um, I don't know what to say. It's, it's not mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's out of love and, and um, yeah. Protection. Pr protection. I think the tragedy is that everybody thinks they're doing the best. Yeah. That is the tragedy of the film, actually. 
And no, go ahead. No, I just think that um, actually it would have been very uh, difficult for for my character, even though she had just one little doubt. Uh, maybe uh, Clara, um, the daughter, didn't tell the truth. It would be very difficult for her also to to pull it back. I think that's what very interesting in this movie too. That first you go down the path. It's it's very difficult to to stop it. Um, Ms. Vault? Well, this film, I think, is about... You say there's, where there's a smoke, there's a fire. This film is about a lot of smoke without any fire. That's how I see it. Because this man is not guilty. That's the whole point. But I think that I react because I think that's my vision of this woman. Her whole life is this kindergarten. And she has always protected the kids. So here comes a little girl, and she, the first little scene I have with her, I think there's something wrong. I have to look after, is this, is this only my imagination? I have to get help. And then I get this man in and who has, so, oop, I'm sorry. So this, it's like one little feather becomes five hands, like the Hans Christian Andersen story. It's about gossip and it's about a witch hunt. And, uh, and in a way, everybody is innocent. She is also innocent because she believes after the interview with Clara and the psychologist, I mean, I'm sure I'm right. Of course I'm right. I have to call his wife and say, he cannot have the son. The son has been in my kindergarten. I have to protect him. So this is what it is, a witch hunt, a, a film about smoke without fire and how dangerous that can be. Ms. Rappaport. Well, I'm the, can you hear me? Yeah, well, I'm the only good woman, <laughs> apparently, so I have nothing to say, no. Yeah, I can agree with Sousa and uh, Anne Louise, and uh, I think Nadia is a strong character and she believes in him. She's, uh, she comes from another culture where uh, they have another, where they have, um, how can I put this? Yeah, this is a hard question. Well, what can I say? Nothing. Um, I don't agree. I can't help you on that. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, sir, I can't help you on that. No, no Thomas, come on. I think on. I'm trying to say can that I... she's from a, obviously from a culture where, where you, um, when you attack subjects a little more uh, precise where we're not chit-chatting around the subject, you know. She's yeah. from a place where you can actually smoke even when the kids look at you. I mean, we have so many rules in Scandinavia. She doesn't understand it. This man went to bed with me yesterday, so he's obviously not having sex with a little kid that's five years old. It's simple in his world. Yeah. In her world, it's simple. And we are complicating everything. <laughs> when we, I mean, we're not saying this is the absolute truth for all cases, <laughs> but in this film, this is what we're saying. The lady in green. Thank you, Matt. And then the, the person over there. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello, I'm from the Guardian newspaper in London. It's a question for Thomas Winterberg. You were here in 1998 with Feston, obviously, and you talked um, about that resulting in a kind of artistic confusion almost for you. And now you're back again. Uh, I wondered if you could talk a bit about that journey and um, what it's like being back. Well, first of all, I was always here. You guys were gone for a while, <laughs> but I was here, and I'm proud of what I did. Meanwhile, uh, back then, I had a little bit of trouble in the sense that Festen was a completion of something. I felt I'd made the ultimate film in a certain direction. I went down a route, and I picked the fruit, and there was no more fruit left on the tree. Uh, so I had to um, abandon this way of filmmaking completely and search for other stuff. And that became very adventurous and also painful at times. But um, I created some, some of the films that I'm most proud of uh, in, in that period. After the smoke settled um, over the years, I've returned to a kind of filmmaking which appears to me be like the, the filmmaking I did all the way back at film school with Thomas. Uh, even before Festin, before Dogma, a kind of, we're trying to make a kind of pure uh, filmmaking, which I'm, I'm very glad to be back in now. Um, yeah, 
So that's it. Question over there. Yes, you. Yes, bonjour, Anne Chalon, Agence France Presse. Thomas Winterberg, I really wonder how much you're joking when you're talking about your country, saying it's a dark and sinister country. <laughs> and I, I, I like to know really what you're feeling about your society, because between Fest and, and Yacht, the way you're portraying Denmark is really a big bashing. <laughs> oh, well, I, I love my country, sincerely. Um, and I'm staying in my country, and I'm proud of the film business in my country at the moment. It's very successful and forceful and powerful. Uh, I also belong to a tradition, I guess, of dark tales. Um, I guess not only Denmark, but Scandinavia in general have always been telling these dark tales. And uh, this is not an, an, an entire image of our country. This is a dark tale from our country, which is a shire of happy little hobbits, sometimes very stern hobbits, and, but, but quite happy people in general, I would say. I'm sorry? I sometimes feel too comfortable in Danish society. It uh, can be oppressively mediocre sometimes, uh, and very, very small. And I'm sometimes longing for fairy, fairy tales uh, abroad. But I guess this is where my most important stories come from. Uh, let's try and project ourselves in a couple of, uh, of months from, from today. Uh, the film will be shown in, of course, Scandinavia and all over the, the West. Uh, but it will also travel, Mr. Winterberg, to Asia, to Africa. What kind of reaction do you expect you'll get from that, particularly concerning the subject of the movie? Honestly, I have absolutely no idea. I, I don't know how universal this subject matter is, but for me, the main attraction of this film, when I watch it, and while writing it with Tobias, is the love between these people. It's not this, sub this um, subject matter of misuse or not misuse. It's the love and caring between these people. When I watch, watch Mass and Thomas in front of each other, trying to reach out for each other with this misunderstanding between each other, that's, that's where my heart breaks, you know? And I guess they understand that in Asia too. In uh, right. Yes, I have no doubt uh, about that, but. And um, so, so, so for me, I don't know, let's see. But I, I hope it, it, it can, cross these boundaries as well. And that's another second point that I might want to make was that decades ago there was a film touching on a little bit of the same subject in front made by André Caillard called The Risque du Métier with Jacques Brel. But since then, of course, since you're talking about the rumor, the internet has allowed for the rumors to spread worldwide instantly. So, do you kind of expect, fear, that this kind of thing might happen more often and faster? Um, yeah, it's very interesting. You, al you almost gave me the answer already. Uh, this little village that we've made, this little microcosmos, um, for us, in a, in a way, is a symbol of the world and, and the fast-traveling communication and fast-traveling uh, rumors. Um, we talked about the, the thought as a virus. And of course, with these media platforms, it, it travels really incredibly fast. And you can create a myth or a lie about a person very quickly. Most identities of today are built on these platforms. And uh, people are now even spreading rumors that they are having a shower or what they're having for dinner. It's, it's being spread out constantly. And I find that fascinating and, of course, a little bit frightening as well. Uh, in that sense, I guess the world has transformed to, uh, into a small village, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, hello. Hello, hi. I'm from da Danish Television. Way over there. A show called Filmselskabet on DRK every Thursday, 8.30. Oh, great. And my cameraman, Fred, right is up that. there uh, shooting amongst 500 other people. I have a question for uh, yesterday's birthday kid, Thomas Winterberg. Sorry, happy birthday. 
Thank you very Have much. Birthday. Let's all sing, right? <laughs> Uh, the films and competition, the main competition this year, is a very uh, strong lineup. How do you feel of your competitors? I have great respect for all of them. I haven't seen their movies. And I'm trying not to participate in this kind of handball or football game. I'm trying to be uh, proud, or I am, in fact, really proud to be in their company. Uh, this mission is, for me, already completed by being here. This festival, for me, is the only festival in the world that protects the small and pure and personal film and yet has the same strong amount of glamour around it. It's such a powerful place, such an important place, and that's why I'm so proud to be here. Uh, of course, we're part of a competition. Of course, I would love to bring back some gold, but, but I truly and dearly feel that mission is completed already. Well, keeping our fingers crossed, <laughs> okay. Now, one last question. Uh, the last question, which is about the last shot. Was it always your original intention to have this as the last shot? Because you, e ah, you end back to the hunt. It's not resolved. There's still the rumor. So I'm curious about that shot. That's well, you. Well, um, <laughs> we, knew that we, we knew that we wanted it to, uh, we knew that we wanted it to end uh, opening a new hunting season. Uh, we knew that we wanted uh, Marcus to become a man. We knew that we wanted to get all the guys together. But the last shot, we discussed a lot. And I think when I, when I delivered my final work on the script, we still had a couple of different endings, um, of course. And then Thomas and Mass and the rest of the crew, of course, decided and discussed how to to tell the story. And even again, probably in the editing room. Because what we're doing, of course, is you're rewriting the script in the editing room. So a lot of stuff is happening there. And suddenly, in a mathematic way, everything makes sense. But when I, when I, left, when I left the boat, <laughs> there were still a couple of endings. And, well, and well, let's not tell the other endings. No, exactly. let's, just say, yeah, yeah. let's just say that there was a gentle and subtle conversation also with the producers and the distributors of the film about the ending. We also have these things in Denmark, actually, those kind of debates. But uh, we're all come to the conclusion that this is the right ending, and we're happy about it. Well, as I started saying two questions ago, keeping our fingers crossed, thank you very much for being here.